California's majestic central coast. It's famously known as the world's greatest meeting of land and sea. Painters, sculptors, writers, all have flocked here, from Jack Kerouac to Ansel Adams, Jack London to John Steinbeck, all inspired to do some of their most famous works in front of a backdrop that staggers the senses. But this is also a place to lose yourself, to separate from society, to live and create and teach and inspire on your terms. It's a place where you can be a master sculptor, engineer, blacksmith, photographer, inventor, where you can have accomplishments that rival those of the Steinbecks and Kerouacs, where you can live in plain sight, yet be all but invisible, especially when that's exactly the way you want it. He was an artist that was off the radar and lived in his own environment. He wasn't looking for fame, he wasn't looking for fortune. Randall Hunter speaks of the man whose story he feels called to tell. It's a story of a man who's forgotten genius he's obsessed with giving new life from the place where it all began. It's the story of a man named Alexander Weigers. Right now, we have the opportunity to tell a story about one of the greatest artists that have ever lived. Alexander Weigers was a Dutchman who grew up on the Indonesian island of Java in the early 1900s, first being exposed to the arts by his mother, a teacher, and to grittier life skills by his father, a plantation owner. She taught him perfect penmanship, she taught him language, and dad taught him about nature and building and blacksmithing. College took him to Holland, where he studied mechanical engineering and naval architecture before returning to Java to work as an engineer. In 1927, Alex and his new wife, Jehovah, set out for the United States. She couldn't adjust to the climate in uh, Indonesia, so they ended up moving to Seattle, Washington. Once in Seattle, Alex found work in the shipyards doing architecture and illustrations. But it wasn't long after that he suffered a tragedy that would define the rest of his life, losing both his wife and baby in childbirth. It was only then that Alexander Weigers, the artist, was truly born. He actually went a little bit crazy there for a while and ended up in the sculpture studio for the University of Washington and he wanted to just sculpt 24-7 and pretty much did that. And that's where he created the sculpture Morning. It's a tribute to his wife and child and the loss that he experienced. It's one of his most impressive works. It's one of the few that he did anatomically correct and without being abstract. It's a pretty special piece. Morning was just the beginning. In the years that would follow, Alex would study under some of the most renowned sculptors in the world, including the legendary Laredo Taft, who was taken with the prodigal talent of an artist whose elegance seemingly had no peer. He's using a Baroque spiral as he's trying to move around. That causes the human eye to move with it and for the piece to move, you see that? Richard McDonald so is one of today's most why. prominent sculptors and sees parallels between himself and the old master. I think that when he was doing this, he was probably in tears on multiple occasions as he was moving through it. There's so much passion in his sculpture. He did it as a pure expression of his soul. I think the artwork was his way of being able to touch deeply with himself and to then express himself through doing the sculpture. It ended up being a healing process for him in a lot of ways. And it was a process that came with a desire not for fame or fortune, but for something far simpler. The goal there is to share. The goal there is to contribute. And the goal is also total, absolute freedom. I don't do it for the market. That's the most important thing. I do it for myself. But even without self-promotion, it wasn't long before the world took notice. 
Now living in the Bay Area, Weiger's work would often be shown at local exhibits and even appeared as far away as the Smithsonian. The San Francisco Chronicle uh, called him a da Vinci uh, because of his many talents and the level of skill that he accomplished in those talents. But the comparisons to da Vinci don't stop there. Like da Vinci, Weiger's had a fascination with aviation. And while da Vinci was drawing up plans for flying machines some 400 years before the Wright brothers took flight, Weiger's had his own futuristic idea he was putting to paper in the 1930s. I think Alexander Weiger's is one of those people that is able to combine science and art. I mean it when I say this, this man was, was way ahead of his time. Paul Moeller would know. For decades, he's been trying to develop his sky car, a machine that would lift off vertically like a helicopter and move on a cushion of air. It's technology that the likes of Elon Musk and Google's Larry Page are still trying to master today. And amazingly, it's the same concept Alexander Weigers patented so many years ago with his discopter. I love it. I really do. I think it's aesthetically and practically and aerodynamically uh, attractive. This drawing that he did in the early 40s uh, was his vision of San Francisco in 1985. And these are big cruise ships, uh, discopters. They were designed to fly, and they're like 600 feet across. And then there's some smaller crafts here that would be more comparable to uh, a city bus. And then there was even smaller crafts, which were individual. It was an incredible time. You know, when you look at the period of time and when he was doing this work, I mean, the Golden Gate Bridge was being built, Mount Rushmore was being carved. It was an incredible industrial time, and there was no limit to what innovators could invent and create. So he was one of those kind of guys that had no limits to what he can do. Weiger spent years pitching his idea to aviation companies and even the military who it was believed had interest in the concept of a flying saucer. But while many expressed interest in the discopter, none would commit to developing it, believing that the lack of a practical power source for the craft made it an idea that was simply ahead of its time. How could I do anything but admire it? I was working on the same approach in 1968, and I would consider myself cutting edge in 68, and, 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 we, and he and I are still way ahead of anybody else during that time period or even this time period today. Today, the discopter is looked at as the inspiration for the iconic flying saucer sketches that began appearing in the 1950s. But at the time, it only represented another disappointment for Alexander Weigers. It really put a damper on his spirit as far as, you know, he, he spent 20 years and all his money and time to create this. He was disappointed. But as it usually did with Weigers, disappointment didn't set him back. Instead, it set the stage for the rest of his life. I think that's one of the reasons why he decided to live off the grid. I've had it with uh, bureaucracy, I've had it with the government uh, influence in his life, and um, I think it's one of the reasons why he never wanted to sell his sculpture, he never wanted to sell his artwork. Um, he didn't want to be embroiled with, in conflict or have somebody telling him how to create. Uh, he certainly didn't want a gallery owner telling him to make it six inches taller and point the head to the left instead of the right. So it's one of the reasons why he did his work for his own enjoyment and for his friends and family. After World War II, during which Alex did intelligence work for the Army, he and his new wife Marion headed for the place they would call home for the rest of their lives, Carmel Valley, California. At first, they lived in a tent on a three-acre plot gifted to Alex by an old army buddy. There was nobody up here then. He referred to it as an Adam and Eve existence. They had chickens, they planted gardens, they ate gopher stew, they had dandelion salads. The tent, though, was just temporary. By 1945, about the time John Steinbeck was publishing Cannery Row, Alexander Weigers was taking discarded materials from Cannery Row and anywhere else he could find them and repurposing them into everything he needed to build his dream house. I think his influence on me was stronger than I realized. Rob Talbot is a prominent businessman in the area. 
and grew up just over the hill from the Weigers. As soon as I could get up to about five or six, I would wander through the field and go visit Alex and Miriam. Alex was a grandfather type. He was a very intense artist, teacher. Though Rob didn't realize it at the time, what Alex was really doing was teaching him the simple life lessons he so believed in, owing no one, living for yourself, repurposing everything in what Alex viewed as a wasteful society. He recycled everything. He never bought anything new. Everything he had was either given to him, found on the road, or just saved. The same philosophies applied to his blacksmithing and his art, which he would spend countless hours crafting in the studio he built adjacent to the house with materials that were far from perfect and tools he always made by hand. It smelled really earthy. You smelled wood, you smelled stone, you smelled coal dust, you smelled the forge. It was all homemade and it was just really magical. And I remember coming in and going quiet you know, not talking loud, I just remember watching and, and I was in this magical place of creation. He could create anything. To survive, Alex bartered for everything and even made it a goal to never earn enough money that he'd have to pay taxes. His days were filled with sculpting and carving, building and blacksmithing. He'd later become an accomplished photographer, even making his own camera lenses and was so skilled as an engraver that the man so averse to making money had to register with the U.S. government because he had the ability to literally make money. He was a master at all the disciplines that he worked in, sculpture or illustration or writing, penmanship. All of it was done to the highest skill level that he can generate. He's clearly a Renaissance man. There was nothing he couldn't do. For Rob Talbot, it wasn't until well into adulthood that the gravity of Alexander Weiger's teachings really sunk in as he began construction on his own house. I think Alex made such a profound impression that if I could find something used, it was better than anything new. So I never wanted to go to stores to buy anything new. So basically, I built a recycled house. That was a long time ago. The lessons learned were hardly exclusive to Rob. At his essence, Weigers was a teacher, first through the many books he'd write on blacksmithing and sculpting, and later through a more hands-on approach. The late 50s, early 60s, he started teaching people, and then the, kind of the rumor you know, got out that there was this man living in a treehouse that'll teach you how to make tools. They came by the thousands to his peaceful enclave to learn from the man with the Dutch accent and sweater vest and to see for themselves a life lived the Weiger's way. He was really about trying to teach people how to live a very beautiful, fulfilling life. Eight hours a day, you kept your mouth shut, you listened, you watched, and he taught us. And we made all our own tools. He used the tool making and the sculpture as that vehicle to teach him how to live a clean, great life curly cues and little hooks that we could put on the wall for our hats and screwdrivers and pliers. We made all our own tools. I still have mine. It gives you the ability to think that you can accomplish anything you want to. I mean, they would look at this guy and go, wow, I'd love to be like that guy. I'd love to live this lifestyle. I'd like to build a house like that and make a hinge like that. Alexander Weigers passed away in 1989. His house and studio have since been lost, but the essence of the place he called home and his art and his legacy will live on as long as the nearby waves are crashing and inspiring and creating new generations of artists, just like they did Steinbeck and Kerouac and Alexander Weigers. I see Alex's stature growing after he passes. We don't know what we have till we lose it. And this story that he has is so vital to any innovator, to any artist, to anybody that wants to live a great, free life. Alexander Weigers is a part of a community where all of us are here for a reason. The environment, the beauty, the, 
spiritual nature, whatever it is. He's a part of a family of many, many artists for a century that have been here enjoying this place and creating the best they can create.